I am the Philosophical Bachelor and today I want to think about whether Buridan's S is the key to free will. How do chess and tennis players, among other sportsmen, decide who gets to go first? For chess, one of the players hides a white piece in one hand and a black piece in the other. Her opponent gets to choose between the two hands and takes whatever side the revealed piece indicates. In tennis and many other sports such as football, it is left up to a coin toss. But how does one choose between what is, for all purposes, precisely two equivalent choices? This is the classical thought experiment or paradox best known as Buridan's S, named after John Buridan, a 14th century philosopher. An S, perhaps you may know this animal as a donkey, is in a bind. It is in the middle of two equally attractive bales of hay and is hungry. How is it to choose? Supposedly, the donkey was unable to choose and finally died of hunger. If you think that such choices of pure equivalence are never encountered in real life, this essay started with concrete examples of precisely such a choice. Games, of course, are somewhat contrived with its made-up rules, but you may have found yourself at an aisle in a supermarket facing a plethora of choices when all you wanted to do was buy some water, or detergents, or cough drops. If, like me, you are an optimizer and somewhat indifferent to the supposed quality of the water, you may start to work out which the most cost-effective option is by computing how many cents per litre for each choice. The lower, the better. If you think you have evaded the choice Buridan's donkey faced, because you are finally going with brand A, which is the most cost-effective, you still have to choose the exact bottle you are going to take from the shelf. Imagine that brand A has two bottles equidistant from your hand or your eye and you only want one. Which should you pick? Your options are 1. Like the donkey, you cannot decide since there is no rational way to decide given that both deliver the exact same value to you and you finally just walk out, no water in hand and thirsty. 2. You choose the one on the right. Being right-handed, it is quite natural for you to choose things on the right. You leave after paying and drinking a satisfied customer. 3. You randomly choose one. Since you have no way to rationally decide, you, like the tennis players, flip a coin and let it decide. Or more likely, you just do that randomizing process in your head and choose one. Like in option 2, you leave a happy puppy. When I started thinking of Buridan's donkey, I was hoping that it will be a negative proof of libertarian free will as an argument against determinism. Determinism is premised on there being an ineluctable chain of cause and effect, or the law of motive, where one decides in a particular way because one motive is stronger than the other, hence making the choice determined. However, determinism seems to fail if the choices are equivalent, because how then should a determinist choose given that they are equivalent? They should end up like Buridan's donkey, but yet we see that a choice often, if not always, gets made in reality, one way or the other. Medieval thinkers such as Al-Ghazali argue that the fact that a choice gets made is because a power that is able to distinguish between equivalent things is what makes the decision, a power such as a free will. However, Burden's donkey fails as an argument or proof for libertarian free will for two reasons. Let's consider what happened in option 2. A convenience factor came into play. The choices were not exactly equivalent. The bottle on the right, simply by being on the right, had a slight edge because of the right-handedness of our shopper. While there is pure equivalence between the two bottles, they are not identical since they are not both in the same position. Hence, we might choose the bottle that came first, that came later, or the one nearest to us, or the one further away, the way our shopper chose the bottle on the right. 
In fact, I often choose the items further back on the shelf myself, since it is less likely to be manhandled by another shopper, which means it is less likely to be damaged. So there is not an exact equivalence, though you can imagine scenarios where the values between the choices exactly balance out making the choice one faced by Buridan's donkey. For instance, a higher paying job is at an office more distant from your home than a lower paying one. And after considering all factors such as duties, stress level, time lost, the cost of transportation and so on, they are exactly in balance with each other. The two choices, while not exactly equivalent since they differ in their details, are however effectively equivalent since they provide the same value to the beholder. This brings us to option 3, where you randomly pick a bottle. There is no rational way to pick between two equivalent bottles, at least if you are only thinking rationally at the level of the fictional donkey. Instead, we are able to think on a higher level, a meta level where the thinking is about the lower level top. In this case, we think about the wider situation. We are thirsty and want some water. We are faced with two bottles of exactly equivalent value and we want only one. We can remain undecided as in option 1, we are unable to decide, we leave thirsty, or we can just choose whichever bottle and leave satisfied. So we are in fact making a choice where we choose to randomly choose one of the two bottles. We had a choice between two equivalent bottles and also a meta choice between thirst or randomly choosing. I had earlier said that there are two reasons why the libertarians have not won the great free will debate by invoking the paradox of Buridan's donkey. This is the first and more important reason. The second is a broader point. Randomness itself does not constitute free will. If our choices are random, it is not an exercise of our free will but is contrary to it since random choice is not really a choice our will makes at all. However, that is not the end of the story. While Buridan's donkey is not the coup de grace for determinism, I think there remains something to be said about meta choices that may yet point towards libertarianism. I want to consider John Paul Sartre's example of choices in his existentialism is a humanism lecture that come close to the case of Burden's donkey. A young man during the Second World War was trying to decide between staying at home, which would be a great comfort to his ailing mum, or to become a soldier to fight for his country. He was torn between two choices which each have their merits and demerits. So for our purposes, let us consider them as effectively equivalent or of equivalent value after weighing up the pros and cons. Many times in life, we face decisions that are difficult to choose between, such as in this case, a love of mother or love of country, or require a choice from us in the face of incomplete information, such as whether one will live or die if one goes to fight. Yet we have to choose. Even when we do not choose, like in option 1, we are choosing something. In option 1's case, the meta choice is to remain thirsty. Sartre's answer to the young man was, you are free, so choose, in other words, invent. If indeed the young man was more inclined one way, then it is not the kind of anguish or difficulty we are talking about with Buridan's donkey. He may take some time to work out his thoughts and recognize his inclination. His decision may be the outcome of a complex of hard-headed rationality and emotions. Indeed, if he did not know his inclination before, his decision will reveal to himself who he is as a person. While thoughts of love for his mother or his country are noble and even pleasant, his actions will be what will bring those thoughts into fruition or reality. But let's stake it that he really is torn right down the middle, faced with an effective equivalence between the two choices. If he does not choose, then he has effectively chosen to stay home with mother and so in that way would have chosen. But what does Sartre mean when he told the young man to invent? In a passage from a different example, Sartre says, They first contemplate several options and in choosing one of them, realize that its only value lies in the fact that it was chosen. Returning to our supermarket and our choice of water, 
When we picked that bottle out of the two bottles, that bottle became our bottle. It is no longer some anonymous bottle on a shelf belonging to no one, but it's now mine. The two bottles, who are seemingly the same as before, are not the same as before. By my choosing one of them, that chosen one through my act of choosing it has become the better, more valuable option. Say Satra's young man decides to sign up as a soldier. In his decision, by his making that decision in that way, he has rendered that option of becoming a soldier more valuable than the other option of remaining home with mother. If we did not know which was better previously, we now tell ourselves stories, making up reasons why the chosen one is a better choice than the other. In other words, we invent those reasons, and in that inventing, we are inventing our essence. We are inventing who we want to be. We are not already that person, but we are self-creating that person. This increased valuation of what we have chosen is born out in psychological studies. Known as the endowment effect, it is where an individual values what he or she already possesses over something new. By making the choice that one made, one is committing to a course of action and all that it entails. What previously was effectively equivalent no longer is, since that other choice and all that it entails is now hypothetical, what the choice one actually did make and all that it entails is now real. In other words, the choice made has become real or is actualized, while the abundant choice has no reality whatsoever. Choosing the way we chose is making a commitment, setting ourselves down a path where we get to enjoy the benefits and suffer the drawbacks of our choice. We can of course subsequently change our mind, though in some cases it may be too late. For instance, if the ailing mother passes away while our young soldier is away, or impossible if the soldier has been shipped off to some border, or come with a cause, such as the cause of defaulting on a contract, or in the soldier's case, punishment for desertion. I began the essay with examples of choices of little consequence, but are more clearly of pure equivalence, such as who gets to start first in chess or tennis or shopping for water. There is a marginal advantage to starting first, which is playing white in chess, but in a tournament, a player usually gets to play at least one match as white and one as black against the same opponent, evening out any advantage. I moved on to more substantial examples from Sartre, where the equivalence is not exact but effective. We encounter both types of choices in real life, though the more troubling ones are naturally the latter. A random selection process may suffice for the more trivial examples, but would such young man really leave it up to a coin toss to decide what he should do? What makes the latter example more difficult and hence more troubling is its impact. Over many games of tennis, the coin tosses I won and lost across all of them is roughly even. However, the young man can only make the decision to stay home with mother or go to fight, arguably only once. The war will not last forever and neither will his mother's life. Such decisions do not even out the way the tennis coin tossers do. If he chooses to go to war, he may be killed in the fighting and then there will be no more further decisions that can possibly even this one out. If he stays home with mother, France may lose the war and then he might have to live with the guilt of not playing his part and bear the cost of defeat, which no further decision can even out completely either. Knowing that his decision has a high impact, we can expect that he will agonize over it more compared to the anguish he faces choosing products in a supermarket. I think that it is in such decisions that we can see how libertarian free will can come into play, but it is not in the decision-making process, be it from a coin flip or some other more involved process. There is another decision that comes soon after or is contemporaneous with the first decision. It is a decision akin to not marrying who you love, but loving who you marry. Or closer to what we are talking about, not having what you want or love, but wanting or loving what you have. According to Saad, the value of our choice lies in the fact that it was chosen. 
What makes our choice more valuable than the other choices is because it is what we chose. The second decision, after the first to decide the matter at hand, is whether to embrace the first decision. The second decision is unlike that of Buridan's donkey. It is a choice to be happy and satisfied with one's decision, to be miserable or for the unthinking to plunge mindlessly into whatever it brings. It is a choice to embrace the life that will ensue from out of that first choice, such as the soldier's life if that was what the young man chose, or to continuously be looking over his shoulder, thinking how staying home would have been. This second decision seems to be the one that arises from our free will, informed as it will be by our character and experiences, though not determined by them. Since the first decision is one made between effectively equivalent options, the options are X hypothesis of the same value, all things considered. Whichever we choose will render us the same satisfaction net of pain, and hence one may expect that the logical response will be a sober carrying on. However, human beings are egotistical and emotional creatures. Even if we rationally cognize that the choices are effectively equivalent, as Sartre has postulated, and the endowment effect has shown, we treat the choice that we made to be more valuable. This recognition of what seems to be unwarranted additional value, however, does not mean that we will automatically love what we have chosen. To love what we have chosen, to keep looking for better things such that we become unable to love what we have, to even hate what we have, is the content of the second decision. This second decision, unlike the first, is not static, one made and completed at one moment of time. It is a dynamic decision we continuously will have to keep making, maintaining or revising as events unfold. While this does not definitively prove free will, I am contending that this second decision is or should be the work of our will. Thank you for listening to The Philosophical Bachelor.